Hey, so Rick Burgess of the Rick and Bubba Show. Thanks for uh, letting me be in your studio to interview you. It's sort of a reverse here. It is. Uh, you know, me sitting here talking to you in our studio, I feel like I should be going, hey, welcome to. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you're you're the host today. I'm the guest. Uh, I'm excited to be on this podcast, and, and I, I'm – uh, there, there could be no bigger fan uh, than me than of what you're doing, uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending some time together. Now, so people who are not from the South, they may not realize that you're kind of a big deal. Well, my mom thinks so. Uh, well, no, the, the Rick and Bubba show is a radio show. So that's how it started. Uh, when I was a child, I can honestly say that God placed this desire to be in radio in me you know, I'm not any help to young people that come to me and say, hey, Mr. Burgess, I can't figure out what I want to do with my life. Can you help me figure out? I, I really can't. <laughs> and and I, I feel so inept on that conversation because this has been a passion that, that God placed in my life. I, I really can only remember having three things I really cared about. American football, um, you know, hunting and fishing, and radio. And, uh, you know, in the radio also, I have, I have a love for music, I always have, but that kind of tied into the radio. And I did play in some bands and do some things like that. So I was just mesmerized with, with radio hosts when I was a child. Uh, and growing up, my mom says I got a tape recorder and I'd record fake shows and pretend like I was on the radio. So God, I just thank him every day that he said, uh, let me teach you why I gave you this passion because I got it wrong. <laughs> For so long, uh, and it, it's a wonderful thing. So we're 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 a radio show. We've been the Rick and Bubba show. I've been in radio for over thirty years, but the Rick and Bubba show has been uh, an item uh, that's available on radio stations, and of course now on TuneIn apps and podcast archives, and you can watch us on YouTube and uh, live or archived, and all the different ways everybody gets content now. But at the heart, we're still a radio show, and we are a show where Seinfeld was a show about nothing. We are a show about anything. Uh, so we're not a sports show, but we talk about sports. We're not a political show, but we talk about politics. Uh, we're not a, a just a pure comedy show, even though we do quite a bit of comedy. And we're not what you would call a Christian, you know what I mean by that, that title, eh, Christian radio, Christian music. Uh, to me, these are just human beings talking about what means something to them. So we, you wouldn't really call us a Christian radio show because we're on all secular stations. But we are Christians who do radio. So when we talk on our show, everything we talk about, all those items I just mentioned, all come through the filter of a biblical worldview. Yeah, and you're pretty unabashed about your faith and your theology. Yeah, I mean, we, we will get down and, and deep and dive in. And uh, I believe when Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, I take that pretty serious. And, and when he says, go out and make disciples and teach them all that I have commanded you, then that's what we should do. So, yeah, we're not uh, – it is not laid back. It's not that deal of, hey, you know what I mean? Uh, or we, we, talk, we, don't talk, we don't say big man upstairs and, so, you know, some of this garbage that, that you usually find in a man that really doesn't know Christ, which is why he's saying that. He, he's never encountered Yahweh when he calls him the big man upstairs. Uh, that's a you know why we do that because that makes him a folksy grandfather and much easier to sin against. You know it's the people that kind of treat Jesus like he's a hippie. You know this kind of stuff. Now we we talk about who God says He is, okay, it, and not not trying to make Him more palatable. No, we don't we don't do that. You, know, you said something key there because one of the things I'm, I get on a lot is that people um, they act like some of Jesus' words he was kidding. So. <laughs> Right. You know, they like the ones about love and tolerance because it's this narcissistic, well, he loves me and tolerates me, but we forget about the incredible demands he has. I mean, the old, if your eye causes you to lust, cut it out. That's right. a pretty big demand. No, it is, and, and I, you're 100% right, uh, Ken, and that's the reason why Promise Keepers and, and, and the stuff that we're doing with men's ministry is so crucial. If you want to wonder, if you ever want to wonder why men's ministry is is frankly not very good at most churches, it's because they've tried to present a a vision of God and and of Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that isn't biblical, hmm. and they think that what they're doing is trying to make him more palatable. When it comes to men, it actually turns men off. If they were told that Jesus said that that if you want to follow him, to deny yourself, pick up your cross. And then he goes to Matthew 7 and says the path you're going to be on is the gate's going to be narrow and the path's going to be hard and most of you can't do it. 
See, the, Mar- the Marines weren't the first ones that came up with the few, the proud, the Marines. Jesus said the followers of Jesus would be the few, and they would be on the path that is hard, and most of people will not do it. And when he says things like, I'll divide your family up, your, 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 your family may hate you, and are you willing to, if they hate you, to pick me over them? You know, these are, these are difficult things. And I think Steve Farrar, who, of course, is on, on your board, and mm-hmm. I have a tremendous respect for him, I thought he had a great um, comment when he said, we got to stop presenting Jesus with only some of his attributes. Mm-hmm. We can't say that Jesus never got angry because he did. We can't say that Jesus never said things that offended people because he did. He said the, 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 where we get in trouble is we don't know how to take these characteristics and hand them out perfectly. Jesus had all of these attributes that a man has, but because he was 100% God and 100% man, in his perfection, he handed out righteous anger perfectly. He handed out meekness perfectly. He handed out telling the truth perfectly. So you don't have to take these things away from him. Just learn how to use them in the correct way. And I thought that was a, a great statement. Uh, is is he, ha- he, he had all these things. He just used them the correct way. By the way, Burgess, this coffee is every bit as good as you said. I it told was. you it was. Yeah, uh, yeah, you were bragging about it. Yeah, yeah. Buzzbox Coffee is a, is a company uh, that uh, they 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 make these in, incredible bags of coffee from places all over the world. And one of the things that we've done at Buzzbox Coffee is we think that one of the greatest things that we could take out to the world is capitalism. Mm-hmm. <gasps> but 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 <laughs> so what we do is we teach these these farmers. Hey, if you want to bring this, we'll help you get it to market because you do need some help there. But we want you to make it top 1% Arabica grade, and we're going to teach you how to use this land that is so fertile for coffee to do it correctly, to make it sustainable. Just just you know, not do it in a way that you're not trying to mass produce it where you can always have it. And we're going to do, show you how. And what's so cool in some of these parts of the country, when we go back is when we when they're doing well with their, their coffee farming, and then we'll come back and they'll have things like, Hey, we're raising goats now. We think we can make money off that too. What do you think about that? And so now they've caught. You know, if you want to raise the standard of living somewhere, teach them capitalism. Mm-hmm. And you know what we've done is the church too many times is we've told everybody sit where you are and wait for us to come back with goods again. You know, and there's Boy, nothing. That's right. And there's but there's nothing wrong with giving, but you need to be teaching them. You know how how can they they stand on their own? And then you see that father standing there with his family, with his coffee farm or his goats or whatever, and he's thinking, you know, I'm making my own way. So BuzzBox Coffee, you can go to rickandbubba.com and uh, look under our sponsors link, and you'll see BuzzBox Coffee. And every time you drink BuzzBox Coffee, 10%, which we'll talk about today, this name may not mean much to you now, but it will by the time we're done, goes to something called the Bronner Burgess Memorial Fund, and that's in the name of our youngest son. And then we hand out these grants to evangelical ministries all over the world. And uh, so it's just a way we believe nothing wrong with donations. I'm for them. They're great. But what we want to do is kind of we're more like the Apostle Paul. We're going to make tents and we're going to we're going to provide our own way. So and we do that with products and, and stuff. So this is a good one. So I'm glad you're enjoying it. Ethiopian Reserve is what you're drinking right now. I mean, that was a long commercial. That it was. I mean, did I do I get paid? Well, I guess, I guess you bought me breakfast. I did. And, so. that, and so in return for breakfast, I get to do an ad on your podcast. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, if you didn't like it, then I'd move on and go, I don't know where it came from. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, I, I was just getting a lesson from Phil Robertson, our mutual friend, yesterday. Yeah. I was out in West Monroe, and he was touring me all over his, his duck hunting property. And he said, you know, I ain't no environmentalist, which wasn't a shock to me. No. But he said he was giving me a lesson about how he managed all the floodplains and the, the, the I guess that river like floods like 30 feet. Correct. And then comes in, and he was showing me how he has the pipes to drain it so that the trees can grow better. He said, I do all this so I can kill ducks. You know, exactly. he's got his thing. God put millions of pounds of protein flying down, you know, to, to come down here. But um, duck hunting season is 60 days long. And mm-hmm. he said, so for 60 days of me hunting, I have made this 1,600 acres of pristine land, perfect with rice and all the millet or whatever else that they eat. So that these ducks are healthier, well fed, they breed better. I made perfect breeding grounds for them. So I'm I'm augmenting the duck population, and it's all doing that great. Not because I'm some bleeding heart environmentalist, but because I want to hunt them. But this is how everything works together, in in one way. 
Yeah, it's we, a we, healthy way. Yeah, we right like right now on your way to the airport, you'll have to dodge American white-tailed deer, and the reason why you'll have to do that is because the, where I live, we love to deer hunt, so we create an environment where deer thrive, mm. and we take very few of them. To your point, but we fill up our freezers, and but the deer overall are now more populated in Alabama than ever. Uh, the herds are healthier than ever. The environment is healthier than ever. We're not developing all these natural forest land and all this natural farmland because we want deer to have a place to live because we enjoy hunting them, which leads to this. If you really love an animal, then you should eat it. <laughs> There's some truth to that. <laughs> there is some truth to that. And I am all for eating the animal in a restaurant. I am too. I, uh, you know, the idea of shooting it and cleaning it and hauling it out. And, yeah. I mean, you know, I live in Colorado, as you know, and uh, somebody was just telling me about bagging a, an elk and how he oh, climbed the goodness. mountain and he's at 12,000 feet elevation yeah. and he wow. sees the elk 400 yards away in a canyon and he shoots it. And now he's got to take an elk yep. up a canyon and down Correct. and pack. I'm like, that doesn't sound like fun to me. They have restaurants for that sort of thing. It comes with a nice little huck- huckleberry sauce and a yeah. side of potatoes. And, and it's fantastic, but I'm not as hardcore as that. I will shoot an American whitetail deer probably this coming weekend. Uh, because our, our rifle season is about to open, I will put it into the back of my truck, drive it to the deer processor, <laughs> who will then process the deer, and we'll fill up the <laughs> we'll fill up the freezer with that. So I'm not as hardcore, but but I do enjoy it though. And the and the meat is fantastic. And back to some of the bleeding hearts out there, whatever meat that we don't need, we donate to a food bank and we feed the poorest people in Alabama. Uh, they have delicious meat that we've all hunted. So you had sort of segue earlier. You've got a foundation for your son, correct? Start the story with what we were talking about earlier with, you know, raised middle class-ish. Yeah. Uh, finally start to get some money and then and take us from there because what I want people to get out of this is where God shows up in immense tragedy, how you dealt with this immense tragedy, and how your marriage survived what destroys almost all marriages. Yeah, so it, the the story is this. My, my wife and I, I'll, I'll give you the long story since the podcast, um, uh, Unlike being on the show, we have to do it in little five, ten minute segments. But my wife. The only I, commercials that we have are the ones you keep. That's right. Man. Sorry about that. And, <laughs> and there's more to come. No, I'm just kidding. So in, in 1996, uh, my wife and I were married. Uh, both of us had come to uh, the marriage altar, uh, the, you know, completely redeemed and reconciled to a holy God through the redemption found only in Christ. But when we when we went through our marriage counseling, both of us were cultural Christians which, by the way, that's just a nice way to say lost. Mm-hmm. Okay, we, yeah, Thank you. Yeah, we, we believed all the same things that de- the demons believed about Jesus, but we were not under his authority, nor had we repented, uh, nor were we reconciled back to God, nor were we involved in any kind of church home at all. Uh, and I remember in the, which a lot of people listen to this need to hear, because there's been a lot of people say, wait a minute, that sounds like me every time I tell the story when I get to speak to men all over the country. And that is that, uh, you know, I was raised, uh, like you said, in, a, in kind of a lower middle class family. Uh, I didn't know that we didn't have a lot of things. It didn't matter. There's no, no heartstring story I have for you. My mom and dad loved me. They were, they have, they're still married to this day. And uh, they introduced me to church um, and, uh, and took us there, mainly out of a cultural obligation. My grandmother is a true disciple of Christ, or was. She's gone on into heaven now. But uh, she lived it. Uh, my dad believed it, but kind of thought she was maybe a little a little radical, which I found out now just means she was the real deal. <laughs> but but anyway, so so and we weren't. Uh, so when I when I left and went to play college uh, football, I I left the church and, and never went back. You, you got to see where you played. Now. I actually played at Troy, Troy, Alabama. Troy. Yeah, it used to be called Troy State. When we, they were Division Two in the Gulf South Conference, and that's when I played for them. They're now just called Troy, and they're Division One now. And where'd your son play? My son, oldest son, played Auburn, and I know this is a bone of contention between the two of us Real because world. of your love of the Oregon Ducks, and we had to do like Phil Robertson to, to the Ducks <laughs> uh, uh, in, in 2010 in the national championship game, and my son was on that team. So so I'm 1-0 and against Ken. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so um, – so anyway, so now you're two and zero because you guys had that comeback against. The oh, that's right. Last year. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're two and zero against you. So anyway, so I um, when when I when I, I I was not in church for 13 years, and I got into the show had just started. I'd been in radio for a while, but I was completely deliberate, perpetual, continual sin, chasing women, drinking, 
had already gotten divorced, was married for two years, had two kids in two years. So my wife then comes in and sees this man and somehow by the grace of God uh, agrees to marry me. So she's mm-hmm. about to be a stepmom immediately, you know, with two little kids. Uh, and she's taking this on. I go to marriage counseling trying to get a, a church to get married in because, you know, I'm a cultural Christian, so you have to do that. Right. And, and so now it doesn't mean anything to you, but you still should do it. And so a pastor called me on it. Rick Cagle, I got to go do his eulogy when when he was laid to rest and got to tell his family about the boldness of their daddy, their granddaddy, their husband. And he looked at my life, and he said, I'm not going to marry you. And I said, oh, man, you, some guy, you got, you got some kind of ax to grind with somebody that's been divorced or whatever. He said, no, I don't even know the details of your divorce. I, I just don't think you're saved. I don't think you're a Christian. Wow. And I was like, what? Wow. And uh, he said, so, so why are you coming to my church? Now, now he's about to be the lawyer to prosecute me on my claim to be a Christian. To judge you. <laughs> well, i tell you what he did. He presented a case, and I was not found guilty of being a Christian. And he, says, uh, he said, um, why are you coming here? I said, because you're in between where her family lives and my family lives. He said, well, where do you go to church? I don't go to church. And then I said that idiotic thing. Well, you know, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And gosh, every time a man says that, are you as embarrassed as I am? And uh, he says, well, legalistically, that's true, but I don't know anybody who's been redeemed by Jesus that does not go to church. They don't go to, they don't go to church to become redeemed. They go to church because they are redeemed. Wow. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, that's a strike against me. Hard to argue that one. And then he began to point out, you do this. It's not a stumble for you. This is who you are. This is how you talk. This is how you drink. This is how you treat women. This is how you, th- th- you get into these fights. You do this, you do that. And he goes, these are not stumbles for you. They're not mistakes. This is who you are. And he says, so I have too much respect for the power of Jesus to, to say that you have been redeemed by him. Jesus can't be Lord over your life. And I was like, wow. So I was kind of offended, you know, and I said, uh, I, you know, are you judging me? Which is what people in their flesh do. They yeah. get offended. Well, are you, who are you to judge me? You know, <laughs> and so... I go home and I can't I can't get away from it and uh, I get the Bible out of my house because I live in Alabama. It comes with your house. You, know, you can't live in Alabama and not have a Bible or two or three. You have like a Gideon right when you move in, it's right, <laughs> right, right over there. Of course, it, it was when you open it, it had that new smell, you know. And uh, and you always tell men this. I said, here's here's he'll tell here's what will tell me about your commitment to the Word of God. If you left your Bible at church last Sunday, when did you discover it was gone? Sunday morning. When the next Sunday came around and you're asking, honey, where's my Bible? That's probably not a good sign. Mm. So I had, uh, I had more Bibles than I knew Bible verses. But I had been exposed to the gospel as a child, and I was thankful for that because I, I understood the concept of even what I was rebelling against without claiming I was rebelling against it. So I opened the Bible in God's great sense of humor. Where does it fall? James chapter 4. James. Look, you know this, and I know this. If you and I said, hey, I'll tell you what, Burgess, Harrison, why don't we get together and let's study the book of James over the next several weeks, you and I at the end of it will be like, we got a lot of work to do. We, we got some growing to do because James challenges us. And he's the kind of guy that we need at Promise Keepers, that we need at themanchurch.com. Do you love an Acts, Ken? Do you love it when they're trying to get the, Jew, uh, the Jewish um, council together and, and they're, they're, they're trying to get this thing worked out between the Jews and the Gentiles? John couldn't get it to come to order. Peter couldn't get anything to happen, so we know that Paul couldn't make it happen, and it said, you know what? We're telling James on you. The Jerusalem council, they sent for James, and what does it say when he shows up? No one opposed him. James was in charge. He was was Jesus' brother, so he's a little hard to argue with. (laughs) Right, but when he showed up, do you love in Scripture, in the book of Acts, it says, and no one opposed him, which means they'd opposed Peter, they'd opposed John, they'd opposed Paul, they didn't oppose James. Mm. James, you know, Paul writes these beautiful letters that are phenomenal. They go on for chapters and chapters. James said, I just need five chapters, Yeah, and I'm done. First book of the New Testament ever written. <laughs> right, and, and it's, Co- it's— Correct a brother in his sin and yes. save him from hell and a myriad of other sins. What about, so you believe in, in the Trinity? So what? So did the demons. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they shudder at the sound of it. all joy, my brother, is when you suffer various <laughs> right. trials. So it's not a fun book. No. And, uh, and don't forget, he's talking to a church during all this. So, so he says to me that day, God through James, submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Come near to God, and he'll come near to you. Well, I'm a man. So I thought, wait a minute. 
submit, come near, resist, submit, resist, come near. That's action, action, action. Mm. Now I'm, talking, I'm not talking about earning salvation. I'm talking about repentance. And I realize I'd never done that. I'm not under the authority of God. I'm under my own authority. And like the pastor had said, and your life looks like, like it. So that day in my little bachelor pad with that, uh, that nasty carpet, I remember just saying, I do submit to you because I was raised by authoritative father, so I understood authority, and I understood I wasn't under God's authority, and I submitted to his authority. I repented of my sin. I told the devil that I was done with him, and I started moving toward God, and then he just rushed to me mm. like the prodigal. And he started the process of radically changing me that continues as you and I are talking now. So when we, Sherry and I, got married, I love when my wife said this. She said, the day that we got married, which is going to help you with this, this big question we're going to talk about, she said, that was the first time in my entire life that I knew that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. That's awesome. What a testament from a wife to a husband. She said, I'd never felt that way my whole life. And, and under God's authority, changing us, redeeming us, and making us holy, we were entering into holy matrimony, and he had us where we were supposed to be. Mm. So from that moment on, so now she starts being a, a, a great stepmom to the kids. We start getting them into church. Uh, then she gives birth to the first biological child, uh, who is uh, now 21 years old. And I, this is preparing us for what was coming because I remember this. And it's important for me to include this. She had this perfect pregnancy, and we had been married for three years. Perfect pre- pregnancy. And on the night that he was to be born, we got there, and she wasn't very far along. And so the, everybody's going, you're going to be here laboring for hours. Tell your family to take showers, do this. I'm telling my mom and dad, go get, the, go get our other two kids. Get up here. Y'all take your time. We're barely starting. You know, she had not progressed very much. But she was in labor enough now, and the water had broke. She, we couldn't go back home. We were going to be there. So they decide they're going to try to speed up the labor pains with Pitocin. So they come in. It's just the two of us. We're the only two there. And they give her Pitocin. And I see my wife grab her stomach, and she has what should not have been an excruciating labor pain, which should not be happening yet. We're not far enough alone. And I see the nurse look over at all the stuff that's, you know, coming out on the baby and all these different graphs they have, and they start looking at these rolls of paper, and she's hollering, ah, and she's just screaming. And they looked at, and I could tell by the look on their face that it wasn't good. Mm. And they said, we're going to have to go get the baby. We're going to have to do an emergency C-section. We think that the, there's been an abruption, and the baby's cut off now from oxygen, and your wife's likely bleeding eternally, internally, so we have to do emergency surgery. And my wife's like, this, you know, it's not what she wanted. You know, she mm-hmm. had all these visions of how it was going to go. Well, now they're putting her to sleep, you know, because there's no time for epidurals or anything like that. And I'm just standing there. I'll never forget this, Ken. I'm standing there out in the hall. I'm kind of confused, and doctors are running, and everybody's running. None of the family's got there yet. And so they run, they push her in there, and I see the doctor scrubbing in. You know, he's, he's rapidly scrubbing in. And I'm like, I, what am I supposed to do? You know, where's that daddy thing where I come in and – and he said, you need to pray is what you need to do. Really? Yeah. And so I'm thankful it was a godly man in that situation. So I did. But I'm three years in. I mean, I'm brand new to the faith. I'm growing. I'm being discipled by an older pastor. We're plugged into our local church, and we're getting involved. But I'm still just a, an infant spiritually. And I said, the Lord, I know that you are in control of who lives and who dies. And I just pray right now you save my child and you save my wife. Please don't let them die. And, and so I look, and they're, they're in there, and I see the doctor, and all of a sudden the doctor looks around, and he pulls this wonderful baby boy out of my wife's body, and he points to the baby, and he gives me a thumbs up. He's okay. And so then he points to my wife, and he says, give me a thumbs up. She's going to be all right. Oh, wow. And so I begin to – and then they said, hey, let's clean the baby up. We're going to do the Apgar score, be sure there's no problems, and we'll give him to you. There's no family there yet. They all know the problem. They're, they're getting trying to get there now. And I remember walking out into that hall, waiting on them to hand me the baby, and they're, you know, sewing my wife up and all this. And I just said, Lord, thank you so much. Just thank you for saving my baby, and thank you for saving my wife. And I remember thinking, this, this Christian thing is really awesome. <laughs> and 
all of a sudden, you know, all these sins I committed have been forgiven. All these relationships I've damaged are working out. I've been, I got a great wife. The show's, you know, just growing. I'm making money like I've never made before. I'm like, man, this, this is fantastic. And I heard so clearly in my spirit, Ken, well, what if they died? Would I be any less great? And I thought, why, why am I thinking that right now? I think, well, I guess God's, and I thought, well, that's a good lesson. I can't wait to tell people, hey, and guess what I thought about? <clears throat> see, it's okay to say that when it hadn't happened. Mm-hmm. But see, what I didn't know is God was prompting me, we're going to keep working, but there's another day coming. So you need to start thinking about if I'm God in all things or just some things. And am I great in all things or just great in some things? Now, I didn't understand that at the time. At the time, I just thought, okay, that's a good word. And so the baby is fine. Sherry is fine. We're going to have another son, perfectly healthy, no problem. Then we have another son, perfectly healthy, no problem. So now there's five of five children and Sherry and me. We're the, we're the Burgess Seven. And, buddy, you know, if we, if we come into a restaurant, you know we're here. And uh, we're just having a blast, and the show's growing. And uh, Sherry and I both came from very lower middle-class families, and, and we had never had access to money before. We didn't. We didn't know it, we were so didn't know what to do, and so we're going taking trips we'd never taken before and doing all these things. And so, in in the fall of 2007, you and I talked about this over lunch today. Uh, Sherry and I, and I'll shorten this story for what, what we're trying to get to. We ended up purchasing a farm that we didn't know we were going to purchase, that just kind of came out of nowhere, uh, and I didn't know why we why this kept coming up. We weren't even looking for a farm. We were looking for a beach house or. a a lake house and decided that those were too expensive and we didn't want to get into all that. And out of nowhere, I started getting these emails about this farm that I didn't want. Uh, But as we got down and we toured it, God kept revealing that he wanted us to take this farm. It was a lot less expensive. We thought it'd be great for our children to have access to rural life. And like our, I got the experience growing up that they had never really experienced. Um, And we'll do a garden and we'll fish and we'll hunt and we'll ride four wheelers and, and it's got a barn and a little bitty house with a tin roof on it, and this is great. Well, that, that's at the end. That's in October of 2007. In January of 2008, uh, I had now started going out and speaking places and telling my testimony. And because I was in radio, the, the first ministry that really was presented to me was youth ministry. Uh, you know, hey, you're the guy that's in entertainment who's being a Christian while being an entertainer. And, you know, so a lot of youth conferences want you to come and give your testimony. And, and I was still, you know, now I'm, now I'm, you know, I've been a, a follower of Christ, um, uh, you know, for 12 years now at this point because uh, it's 2008. And um, so I'm, you know, learning. I'm further down the road. And I remember I was preaching, and the verse that I used at the end of every session when I left in, in January of 2008 to go speak and left my wife and children behind at the house, I went to, to, to talk in six different sessions in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, uh, up in the Gatlinburg, Tennessee area, and I'm at these conference centers, and I'm speaking to these groups of youth with Scott Dawson's Evangelistic Association. Scott and I are still dear friends to this day. And my last verse was John 16, 33. I said, and I want all of you to remember with all the things going on, you know, with 2008, that was another time when things were getting kind of rocky in our country, very not near as bad as now, but at that time it was things were getting uncertain. And uh, I said, remember that Jesus said, I say this so that you'll have peace. And I said, Didn't, don't we all like that? I mean, the meaning, isn't that what you really want? If I was to ask you what you really wanted, you'd say peace. You want to know that everything's going to be all right. Well, Jesus says in John 16, 33, I say this so that you'll have peace. In this world, you will face tribulation. Not you might, you will. But when you do, always take heart, have joy in your heart, because I have overcome the world. Whatever it is, Jesus is overcoming. He's overcome our sin problem. You know, we all deserve hell, but Jesus said, I'm going to resolve that. So I've resolved your eternity, so you always hang on to what really matters and remember who I am, and I've overcome it. I'm better than whatever you're facing. I'm stronger than whatever you're facing. And that's my speech. And then I walk out after the fourth session. I had two more to go. I got into the van to be driven to the next arena, and my phone had been ringing while I was talking, the, la- the, the, the session I just finished, and it was from my house. So I call back, and that's not abnormal. I mean, you go on the road a lot. You get a call from your family. Hey, what's going on? Y'all, 
how's it going, you know, and all this. Hey, the kids, I want to talk to you, whatever. And my wife was frantic, and she said, you got to get everybody there to pray. And there was about 7,000 youth there. And I said, what's happened? She said, I don't know how this happened. And I said, what, what, tell me what's happened. And she said, the baby got out of the house. The boys were all playing. He got out of the house. I don't know how he got out of the house. He's fallen into the swimming pool, and he's drowned. And this is the baby. This is our fifth child, fourth son. Uh, and his name is Bronner. Back to the Bronner Burgess Memorial Fund. I remember Sherry wanted to name him. She was, you named all of them. Let me name this one. And all of our kids, we didn't know they had B names until we got down to the fourth one. So now you can't change your B theme, you know, because now that kid feels weird. So my, my kids' name are Brandy, Blake, Brooks, Brody. And so we get down to the last one. She says, I want to name this one. I want to name him Brock. And she said, oh, you're trying too hard. That's that super hyper, you know, Brock. You know, you're trying to make him out to be another linebacker and all this. And I said, well, maybe. And she said, I don't know. I just like this name Bronner. And I said, that's somebody's last name. I don't – that's not even a first name, honey. She said, I don't know. I don't want to do a weird name, but I kind of want to do a unique name. I like Bronner. I said, okay. Well, you know, well now, it, you know, again, there's God again. He has a unique name that you may not forget. And so – she said, you got to get everybody to pray. He's drowned there. And now the EMTs are trying to revive him. And I'm like, and think about, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you know how it is when your wife's having trouble and you're on the road and you can't just be there. There's distance between you. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you're not going to get to them in the snap of your finger. Even if you come up with this great plan to get to them, there's distance. And so immediately people started in. I had driven there, which is about a four and a half hour, five hour drive from where I lived. And so people immediately says, we got to get you on a plane. We got to get you back quicker, which I was, I agreed. Go ahead. You don't have to speak these last two sessions. We'll get out and tell these kids what happened. We'll get them praying for you. So now you're on, you're trying to get back. And I had a friend that said, get in the car. I'll take you back to the hotel, get your stuff and I'll get you to the airport. They're sending a plane for you. Yeah, I found out later all the different people that were moving around trying to get a plane to me, which I was so grateful for. Mm. And so he and I are riding in the car, and I guess we're just so accustomed to God doing what we want. Hmm. And I remember him being confident. He says, hey, it's going to be all right. Your, your, your son's not going to die. And we both kind of, you know, I mean, that's how this turns out, right? And I start thinking back to, you know, Brooks and the problem that he had at his birth, and I was thinking, well, God, he turned that around. But in the back of my mind, what if they had died? What if they, would I be any less great? So I said, well, I'm going to call the hospital. I got to get some kind of update of some kind because my wife, you know, she's shut down now. I'm not, I can't get in touch with her. And I called and I said, I'm calling to check on my son. What's your son's name? And I said, William Bronner Burgess. He goes, my Bronner. All right, hang on just a minute. So they put me on hold. We're in the car driving to the airport. My friend's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. And the chaplain picked up. And right then, you know what's about to happen. The chaplain does not get on the phone to say, hey, everything's made a turn, everything's better. He's fine. He's in there laughing. Your wife's with him. Had a scare. That's not what chaplains do. Mm -hmm. So the minute the chaplain picks up, you know what's about to happen. And I remember feeling this overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit just pressing in on me, pressing in on me. And, of course, my friend's looking at me like, so? And the chaplain, I'll never forget this, says, Mr. Burgess, are you alone? And I really wasn't talking about my friend driving. Just uncontrollably, I said, I'm never alone. I'm never alone. And, you know, we're not. If we belong to Christ and we have the God's Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit, he's always there, the comforter, the, the helper. And I felt the presence of God. I felt the comfort. I really did. I felt the strength just saying, hey, I'm here. And I'm in control. I'm here. And, uh, and then I said something so weird that could only be supernatural. I said, I can't imagine what you have to do every day. And the chaplain said, what? I said, I don't know. I just feel like I need to pray for you, man. I can't believe you have to tell people what you're about to tell me. Mm, I said, you have to do that every day. You know, I just had a, I had a connection to this chaplain, you know, just. And, um, and then the chaplain said, Mr. Burgess, your son could not be revived your son's passed away and I said well, where is my wife and the chaplain said 
there's people with her. And I said, you tell her that I'm coming to her right now. I will be there. So then became the, pro- came the process of walking to that plane and getting on that plane. And I remember looking out the window, and it was so weird because the moon was there where it was supposed to be. And, you know, you think the whole world's come apart because your world has. And I sat down. I don't even remember what the pilot looked like. Years later, he said, I'm the pilot that flew you. I just, I mean, you know, you're, sure. you're tunnel vision. And I said to God, because of the, this relationship that we're given with him through Jesus, I said, Father, what are you doing? I don't, what is this? Because you know what? I knew enough, now a 12-year follower of Jesus, unlike the three-year follower of Jesus. This time I know enough to know that he allowed it because I know he could stop it. He's already shown me he could stop it if he wanted to. If that was his will, he could stop it. But he didn't. And so I said, so what are you teaching me? What is this? And I, and I just felt in my spirit the word perplexed, perplexed. I want the world to be perplexed. They expect you to reject me in this, and I want you to glorify me. They're about to see the real deal because I was totally dependent on him. The, you know, either, either I remember my brother saying, "Who, you know, your brother knows you pretty well. And my brother said to everyone I heard you know, months later, he said, I told everybody this is going to go one or two ways. Hmm. It's either going to be – one of the most awful things we've ever seen. And Rick is going to reject God, and he's going to turn on his family. He's going to turn on God, and it's going to be ugly. Because he knew that I was capable of being that guy too before Jesus because I was a bad guy. He said, or this is going to be really something to watch. It's going to go. There will be no in-between. This won't be some mediocre response. And so when I get off the plane, I could literally – you can't really feel your feet touching – the ground, you, you can't really feel it. Mm. And you, you're kind of almost being ushered like you're gliding into the hospital. And he had just given me everything that I needed. And, and my wife, you know, describes in her book that she, she took five years to write a book about where is God in this? And, of course, you know what the answer is, right in the middle of it. You know, Scripture's not silent on suffering and pain and, you know, and, and all of this. It says quite a lot about it and who God is in it. And... So at this time, though, we, you know, she's just grasping for answers, and she said, I was, I was there, and, and, and I was praying for my child to be revived. And she said, and, and they're trying to revive him, and I can, she said, I can remember these audible words coming out of my mouth that I couldn't pray. You and I talked about this, and we did the Facebook Live thing. Romans chapter 8, sometimes the Holy Spirit prays what you ought to be praying. And she said, I heard myself saying, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And she said, I couldn't pray that. Because I didn't really want that. I wanted him to do what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But his will be done. You know, Jesus in the garden. Father, not my will but yours. If there's any other way, if there's not, then we do this. So he, he was not revived, as you know. And the doctors told her that you know, they had to stop. And she said, so at that moment, my pastor came in and he tried to console me, uh, which he should. That's great. Uh, our family came in that was there and tried to console me. Our friends started surrounding me. She said, but there was an awkwardness in that hospital because they all knew that they could not be my husband. They couldn't. They couldn't replace him. They couldn't be the children's father that were still survivors. So we all waited on him because no one could replace him. Listen to me, man, who's listening to this podcast right now or watching this podcast. you got to stop with this attitude that somebody else can do what God designed you to do. Amen. No one else can. You know, men and women are equal, but they're not the same. They don't have the same responsibilities. They don't have the same roles. We're not them, and they're not us. Now, I know you got a society right now that says that's not true, that we're interchangeable. We're not. We can't do what they provide for the children, what they provide to the marriage. And they can't do what we do, what he designed us to do under his authority. We're either an asset under his authority or we're a detriment outside of his authority. And so... When I got there, I just went over to her, and I took her in my arms, and I kissed her, 
and I held her, and I began to talk to her and pray with her and speak Scripture over her. And she said, in that moment, that's when God was revealing to me that everything, it was going to be hard, but everything was going to be all right. And so we started the process uh, and found out why God had given us that little farm. I, I told you about that, Ken, because my wife said, I don't think I can be back at the house where this happened. We may, we may eventually stay there, but right now I can't. And I thought, well, look at you, God, providing a place for us to go for refuge. And we went and lived in this little tiny house with four children in a tiny house with a tin roof on 80 acres. And, uh, and you know what we did? We, we, we grieved and we spent time together. We didn't have a TV. We went outside to play. We, we, um, when the kids had to go to school, they would come back to school and, and then we would be there. And, and so at the time of me trying to go back to work, back to do this show that I still do. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I didn't know how to do that. I thought, well, the comedy part of it's going to feel weird. Mm. Uh, and talking about ball games is going to feel weird. Talking about politics is going to feel weird. And I just said, I was sitting in a little chair in that house, Ken, and I hope one day you and I get to go down there and I'll show it to you. I'm sitting in this little chair. I'm trying to get up to go back on the air for the first time. And here's the beauty of, of brothers in Christ. My brothers in Christ stood at that studio and waited on me. All they did was stand where I could see them when I started doing the first show that I went back, and they just looked at me and prayed for me the whole time I was there to help me get through that first show. But it, when I'm ready to go, I don't think I can do it because I can't. And I said, Lord, I just don't think I can do this anymore. I mean, I can't even tie my shoes right now, and I really couldn't. I physically would try to tie my, some boots I had on. I couldn't tie them. And I'd been raised by a very strong man who taught me authority and toughness and move forward, go. Hey, you, you, got, you can't, everybody's depending on you. I knew all that, and I'd lived that way. And God said, you know, I said, Lord, I can't do this. I can't even tie my boots. And he was like, no. No, now you're actually ready. <laughs> the problem was, Rick, that you weren't strong enough. The problem was you were never weak enough. And now I've got you to the point that you're asking me to help you breathe you're asking me to help you tie your boots. Now I can actually use you in a way that I never could before because you're finally dead. You finally died to yourself. And now I'm, I'm going to build you back into a man that is totally dependent on me. And that has been the process, and that has been kind of where we've been on our journey, and it continues you know, to, to this day. Well, I think you've already answered the question at a high level, but you know, what, what is the number, like 90% of couples who lose a child get divorced or something? How did you avoid that fate? Jesus, the, the faith, like you said, our marriage is not based on, my wife's name is Sherry. Our marriage is not based on Rick and Sherry. I'm imperfect. She's imperfect. I don't, I don't put the pressure on her to fulfill me. She doesn't put the pressure on me to fulfill her. Uh, we, we built our house under the authority of Christ. And I can honestly tell you that I believe that marriages that fail in this situation are marriages that are not under the authority of Christ. I, I, be, I believe this, all it does is reveal the state of the marriage. For, for though, I mean, I knew who God was in all this because he had prepared me for this. I wasn't like losing my mind going, how do these things happen? What is this? Why do bad things happen to good people? You know why? Because I knew I wasn't a good person. There are no good people. And I wasn't saying, oh, my, what, what, what was my wife doing? And what, I shouldn't have been. I thought I was supposed to go speak at this thing. Well, you were. You know, I knew Psalms 139, 13 through 16, that he, when he wove my child together in, my mother, in his mother's womb, my wife's womb, that he said he had written in his book every day of Bronner's life before he had ever lived one. So my son's life is not incomplete. It's just, it's just complete in, in two and a half years. That's what God designed. And, uh, and I've seen what he's done. through a, that, that little boy has been used by God to impact more people than men who are listening to this that are in their 80s. They've lived a lot longer than that little boy lived, but they, have, they haven't had near the impact. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I can honestly tell you, I, I know it probably doesn't make as good a movie, but we never had the, that time of our marriages in trouble and, 
and oh no, please please don't blame me or, or or please don't blame me because I was gone and don't blame me because that just never happened and and it and it didn't happen because of our marriage being based on the foundation of Christ. Uh, we knew that bad things can happen. You know, as my, my wife talks about before, she said she cried out to God, you know, why the children? But we were so happy. And you know what God said? But I, I called you to be holy. I called you to be holy. And, and, and speaking of the children, but what about, what about God's children? My, my wife said something that this is about to rock your world. It's a very profound thing, and this is the first time I've told you, so I get to get your reaction. I, this was incredible. She said, I was trying to figure this out. She was at the farm. She said, and God said, what about my children? So you're going to get reunited with your son. Y'all are going to spend eternity together. But the children that reject me and they reject my redemption that I provided for my children, God talking, when they reject my holiness because I'm holy, and if they're not redeemed by my son, they can't come into my presence. And I lose my children every day that will be forever out of my presence. Mm. And you know what Sherry said? Listen to this statement. This is going to blow your mind. And she said, for the first time, I had compassion for God. My, my, my poor, poor, pitiful me shifted, and I felt compassion for God. How hurtful that must be for him to watch his children reject him and forever be out of his presence never to return so if i have to go through suffering but yet it will save more of god's children and if one person is redeemed this is my wife if one person she said this on fox news and i thought i thought the whole i thought i thought the fox team was going to just completely melt you ought to seen their faces she said if one person is redeemed because of the earthly death of my son then it was worth it wow wow then so be it so it's not about us. So your wife had the spiritual maturity to actually see God as a being, Correct. which is what he is, yes. as a father. Correct. Which I don't think most of us really see God that way. No, I agree. He's not some mist out there or something like that. He's a being, and he is our father. And, and, and you know what? We are his children, and he provided redemption, and sometimes his children just reject it. You had a foundation built up, and I, I talk to men about this all the time. Um, they whine about their sins, and they whine in their laziness that they can't read Scripture or whatever. Mm. When the crap hits the fan, mm. this is a, an adult or you know PG show, so this is the, it's the crap that hits the fan. <laughs> right. When the crap hits the fan, who you are at that moment is what comes out. Yeah. The, the preparation you've given you, the spiritual maturity— you had to be there for your wife in a myriad of different ways that you couldn't understand because you could you didn't just need to be strong, you needed to be empathetic, you needed to be soft, you needed to be sensitive. At the same time, you did need to be strong. There's a time to cry mm-hmm. and a time to not cry. Correct. And all that stuff, all the man that you had become at that point came out in that moment that either was going to drive you two together or drive you apart. Correct. And, and I think one of the things that, um, that I think about this um, a lot is that God loved me enough to start preparing me for it. you got to pay attention for those things. And what you can't do is, like you said, wait till this kind of thing hits you, and then you think, I wish I'd known these things. I wish I had been in the Word of God. I wish I was seeking God. And I remember so vividly, perfect example, my wife honestly could sit down on this podcast and say, Ken, if you would like to, we can start with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and I'll walk you through the revelation if you'd like to stay on the air till I'm done. Uh, and she could do it. But. Can we skip Leviticus? And right, I know. Yeah, and she really bogs down in that. But let me say this. <laughs> but in all, in all seriousness, so you would think, and a lot of men do this, my wife's good, she doesn't need me. I, she doesn't matter if she has a spiritual leader. My wife's more into Bible study than I am. She knows more than I know. Mm-hmm. So listen to this moment. So I come home from work one day. This is maybe month, maybe week eight, somewhere in there. And because I'm a man, I'm trying to do that thing of now we got. I'm, I got to see how this is all working out. And my therapy was what working, was speaking, was going like an idiot. I went on a book tour way too soon. This was a book that we already had going from Rick and Bubba. Should not have left her that that soon. I, I was just thinking if I the more now I got to get out there and do these interviews and do this, do this. 
And so I come home. She's in the kitchen. She's laying in the floor. She's sobbing. Mm, man. And, and she looks up at me, and she says, so tell me again why the God, God allowed this to happen. Now, this is a woman that's been saying all the right things, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, she knows this. I'm you know, like an idiot. I'm kind of like, I don't understand this. And, and so I said, well, you know, we talked about Psalms 139. Uh, we talked about all the verses about suffering. We talked about 1 Peter 1, 6, and 7. We, you know, you, you, when, she, when she was on the, on the morning after our son went to heaven, I think we passed out for maybe 15 minutes, 18, 20 minutes. It's all the sleep we really got. And I walk into the room. She had actually got out of the, gotten out of the bed before me. And she has our children sitting around her. And she's on the couch. And she has the children reading Romans chapter 8 to her from beginning to end. And when they would finish, whoever was reading it, she would say, again, read it again. And so I'm, I remember that. And I'm like, you know, and I looked at her and like an idiot I said, honey, I mean, I'll tell you these things, but you know these things, and I've already told you this, and I'll never forget this, to your point. And she looked up, and she said, well, then tell me again. Well, what if, what if she said, tell me about this, and I said, I don't know. Mm-hmm. What if I didn't know? What if I said, well, you're the one that studied all that. Where would she be right now? Mm-hmm. Where would our marriage be? It's a powerful point. You know, what if I didn't know? See, that's the thing I think men don't understand. You need to know. And, and like you and I have talked about, just devote the same passion and time and effort to knowing the Word of God as you do to all your hobbies and all the other things you care about. You're an expert on those. Not because you have great study habits, but because you care about it. So why, are, why don't we have that same drive? And I'll tell you why. If you don't, it's because it isn't as important to you as the things you're an expert on. It's not because we don't have good study habits. It's because we don't really love it the way we do the things that we know a lot about. But see, your wife and your children are going to pay a terrible price if you don't know. Because, I mean, look at the state of this country right now. Now would be a great time to start knowing what the Word of God said and who God says He is and where we're headed. And so you can tell your children and your wife, don't worry. I remember growing up as a little boy. My dad's a big guy. I played uh, linebacker and fullback, and you know I have to hear about that all the time in the SEC when they played both ways. Well, you know we played both ways. We didn't even have a face mask. I know dad, but you know, and so he's that guy and tough as nails, successful football coach. And I remember, and this is the way we need to, like you're talking about, see the 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 man of the house under the authority of the ultimate father. We used to go down, Our, parent, our grand, my grandparents had a little cabin down on the Black Warrior River, and they had one of those old little old-timey ski boats. Where, where is that? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. The Warrior River is really big, but it's in Alabama, and it runs uh, from the top of Alabama all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, down into the, the Mobile Bay, down, down that way. It runs to the whole state. Okay. So this was kind of outside of Birmingham, Huey Town, out that way. And so they were there for years. In a little cabin, and they had one of those old timey ski boats. You know, you men had the little window in the front and whatever. And I remember we would be out in the water, and sometimes storms would be coming. And I remember as a little boy, I'm not, you, I hope you had this experience. I don't know the relationship you had with your dad, but I would look, and my dad with those big muscular legs and a pair of shorts would get up on that steering wheel and he'd start looking. You ever seen somebody look over the top of the actual windshield when they're driving a boat? And he would look at the water. And the minute I would see him driving the boat, I was at perfect peace. I was like, well, there's Dad. He's got this. Now, I don't know whether he had it or not. I never knew if there were times where my dad was going, oh, buddy, we're in trouble. You know what I mean? But I never noticed it. I, never, I couldn't see it. He was calm. He had it under control. And so when I would look at him, he was a calming force. And that's what our families need to see from the man of God in their house Hey, Dad, is everything going to be all right? Yeah. Let me tell you who God is. Let me tell you what the Scriptures say. At the end of it all, guys, it really is going to be all right because of this biblical truth. Dad, why is this happening? Bam, this biblical truth. This bi- Dad, why is this the biblical truth, biblical truth? Hey, Dad, are there many ways to heaven? Biblical truth, biblical truth. Hey, Dad, what's Dad? Well, hey, at school they say God's, 
God doesn't have really have a standard of marriage that that you know that we that every that really anybody can be whatever they want to be, whatever gender they want to be. What's the Bible say about that? See, when you don't know those kind of answers, you know, it, you, you're really setting your family up for failure. And, well, and nobody's going to replace you. This is how we got where we are because we have outsourced the, the spiritual uh, education of our families to the government and to school and, and to corrupt churches. Yeah, Rick, it, when you were going through all that, some people listening to this now have gone through this trauma or something mm-hmm. related. But many more people have been the guy that was the friend of somebody who went through it, right. or they will be. Uh-huh. When you think back to how people responded to you, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, what was the right thing to do? I mean, there's those people that run up with the patronizing verses, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you, your right. wife was being read at Romans 8, you know, 828. Yeah. All things work together yeah, for right, good, yeah, right. which when your son just died yeah. doesn't sound very good. How should guys who are responding to this kind of trauma in someone's life, a okay. family member, how should they have responded? Well, here's what you don't say. You do not say, you know, sometimes we don't know why. Please don't ever say that. That is a terrible statement. Well, you know, sometimes we just don't know why. Now, people are looking for answers. Mm. What you really need to know is not the patronizing verses. You need to know the part of the Bible that talks about who God is in all this. Hey, once you know that your loved one's life is complete, remember what God said in Psalms 139, 13 through 16. I know it's hurtful right now, but their life's not incomplete. Hey, you know, this is a, hey, man, we're praying for y'all. This is a great time for, C.S. Lewis said, you know, a pain and suffering is God's megaphone for a sleeping world. He's giving you a megaphone right now. And one thing that really helps, and I've seen this turn, especially a dad, on the dime. I'm talking about people who were like ready to reject God. And you know what I say? Don't let this be your son's legacy. Let, let your son's legacy, you know, don't let it be where your son died and, oh, by the way, we all turned away from God too. You know, mm-hmm. your son would be it, It's going, don't let that be my legacy, that my death ruined my family and turned my family from God. Because your son is in heaven. Yeah, and He right. wants to see his family. Right, and so don't let that happen. Like Sherry talks about very, very straightforward. We started out thinking about being heaven-focused because our son was there. Now, now we matured through that to realize we're heaven-focused because Jesus is there. But he used this to get us pointed toward heaven. So talk about the legacy that's going to come from this loved one's death, this tragedy. Hey, looking forward to how God's going to use you. In First Peter, people say that. Hey, don't remember in First Peter, he says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials to test the genuineness of your faith. You have a platform. We're praying for you. We're here for you. But please don't come up and act like you don't have any idea what's going on right now. Sometimes we just don't know why. You know how I interpret that? Sometimes I don't read the Bible. Hey, I'm sorry I didn't get prepared for this moment. Cover them in Scripture. Hey, remember, God tells us and, and, and tells us that He's near to the brokenhearted, and give them out of Psalms where that comes from. Hey, hey, don't forget this. Don't forget that. Hey, John sixteen thirty three. I say this. So the, Bible verses. Bible do, verses. Do. Cover and hey, pray with them. Don't just say I'm praying for you. Pray with them. Put your hands on them right then. Hey, be there for them. Show up at the door. Hey, I just want to drop by. Hey, we want to come in and just sit with you casseroles help they always help you know and i remember a, a guy came in my door up here who's a dear friend of mine now rich wingo he knew that i'd been doing the, the what i should do as a dad under the power of, of christ he comes up my office one day and says we're not going anywhere i'm shutting the door and now we're going to sit in here and talk about you we've talked about your wife you talked about your children you've been doing this how are you doing let's sit here let's talk about it get it out here you mad at god say something you know, and, and then let's work. Let's walk through the scriptures together. That's good stuff. Yeah, that's how it works. I remember um, working on a major business deal in 2004, and um, my son had this horrid asthma attack, mm. and I, I had to go from my office and pick my son up, and well, I don't know why we didn't call the ambulance, but um, rushed him to the hospital. It was pouring rainstorm, and got him in. He was three years old. And he was laying there, and if anybody's ever had anybody almost die of asthma, they'll know what I'm talking about. Mm. You can see the the ribs, the, the, the sucks in around the ribs, and their their lips turn blue. And mm. I remember that little three year old looking at me like I was going to do something, right? Oh wow! And he's trying to talk, but he can't because he doesn't have enough air, and so he just have this gasping sort of. And he doesn't realize he's he's still happy, right? And they're trying to get an IV in him, and they can't mm. blood squirting all over the place from oh, the IV. And I, I remember that feeling of utter hopelessness. And I remember that feeling of um, that huge business deal that I was working on. 
I could just care less. I mean, uh, right. what was so important to me an hour ago means nothing. So Lord, true. take my business, take my house. Take I'll live in a tent. Yeah. Just give me back my boy. Amen. And I remember them coming in saying, we can't handle your son. We've got to have to take an ambulance him to Children's because his oxygen is so low. And yeah. we rode in the ambulance down there, and my son's eyes were rolling back in oh, his head. Oh, my goodness. You know, that, that was an all-night thing, and he he finally re- did recover, and the only thing he could remember was how much fun it was to ride in the ambulance. How about so that? So I'm glad one yeah. of us had fun in that's the ambulance. That's right, that's right. But it, but it is moments like that. You know, mm-hmm. why did I get to keep my son, and now he's you know outgrown asthma, and he doesn't even remember what it was like anymore? Yeah. But, but we just don't know. Right. And God, in his grace and his love, always has our best in, in mind. But there's stuff going on that is beyond us. There is a right. plan. And as you said, every one of us has a mission when we're born. Uh, people hear me all the time quote Ephesians 2.10, for we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Every one of us has a plan, and your boy had a plan. No question. And that two-and-a-half-year-old boy reached all these people. Unfortunately, there was also great pain for people involved. Yeah in that blessing to other people. As Christ said, sometimes a seed has to fall to the ground and die so that something can grow up. Exactly. Yeah. And and we've seen that over and over. God will just confirm. There'll be days that I'll be like thinking, okay, I'm kind of drifting in despair a little bit because it never really goes away from you. And all of a sudden, boom, an email will come in. I want you to know I watched your eulogy on YouTube. I want you to know that, hey, this happened. Know that your son's life was used by God to to give us what we needed and, and also you're like, there it is again. He just continues to confirm and affirm. Over, He always gives you that little bit of something when you need it. And uh, and then a lot of this has to do with there's a freedom in it. Do you really think, honestly, look at me, do you think I'm afraid of COVID? <laughs> what are you going to do to me now? Mm. Uh, I've buried a, a two-and-a-half-year-old little boy. What else would you like to bring after me? I'm free. What are you going to do to me? You know, you kill me, like Paul said, to live as Christ, to die as gain. So what? You know, I want, I want my life to count for the kingdom of God. I want to disciple my, my, my wife, disciple my, my children, and go out and make disciples and disciple men because like you and I have been saying, if, if you disciple men, you change everything. Yeah, and we need the men to be in the proper place under the authority of Christ. Rick, what about the guys that have screwed up? What about the guys that went through trauma and screamed at their wife? divorced their wife? <sighs> what about the guys that drove their kids away and they're gone and they don't know what to do? Well, you know what? It's never over as long as you're on this side of the dirt, right? I mean, it, it, it's never over. There's always hope. So why don't you say, instead of saying, because well, here's what Satan wants you to know. He does, he does it to me because I lived as such a wretched man before redemption, and I made a lot of mistakes. And, you know, I'll be sitting here just like when you start talking to me about promise keepers. Here he comes. You know, here comes the accuser. Mm. Promise keepers. You, they don't want you. Look at the kind of man you used to be. You're, you, I, I mean, and he tries to bring up all the things you did and wrong. Sometimes he uses people. There's, there's people that are really oh, well, right. willing to spread his message Look, for him. There's plenty of people that, that still wish that I was the person I was before Jesus because it made them feel better about themselves. Uh, not everybody's happy for you when you start – you know, raising the standard a little bit of what it looks like to follow Christ. They'd rather you kind of stay mediocre so they don't feel challenged by it. Mm -hmm. But you don't let that bother you. But back to that man. The adversary wants to tell you that you've blown it. There's no way to repair it. It's over. Nothing you can do. That's absolutely wrong. Have you looked through Scripture at the men that have done the most horrific things that God redeemed and used them to make an impact for his kingdom? Does that mean every relationship you damage will be repaired? There's no guarantee of that. But I tell you what it does mean, you can, get, you can repent of your sin, you can be forgiven, you can be redeemed, and you can be made new in Christ, and he can use you to advance his kingdom. And it may or may not be restored back to you on this side of heaven, but the bottom line is you can be a follower of Jesus, and you can do the right thing before you're dead. Some of the, some of the most powerful men I've seen and I know of one who didn't even become a follower of Jesus till he was 73 years old. And the last five to six years of his life, he was an absolute warrior for the kingdom. So you're, you're not done yet. Don't, this is not your legacy. This isn't how it has to end, okay? Not everybody does everything. There's a lot of things that if I would have been redeemed sooner, I would have done differently, okay? 
Uh, I, I, I abused God's standard of marriage before I entered into the holy matrimony he intended. I wish that had not happened. I can't go back and change that in my history, but now my wife and I go forward and say, no, this is God's standard for marriage, whether I always adhere to it or not. This is not talking about perfection. Nobody listening to this or watching this is perfect, nor have you ever been, but it is about progress. It is about a new life. It is about a new birth. I'm not remotely like the man I once was. Does that mean that man never existed? Does that mean all those relationships from that that, that man wrecked were all redeemed? No. There's some people to this day that still don't have anything to do, to do with me. I understand. But you know what? That's not what it's about. I just have to be right with God and be used where he can use me. So it's not over. Right now, repent and be redeemed and, and finish well. Finish well. It's not over. What about the guy who's not saved? How, how mm. does someone come to know Christ? It's real simple, but, but not simple. Simple and not simple because you've got to deny self and you've got to repent. We've lost this in the Western church. When's the last time you heard grace? When, when's the last time you heard somebody preach repentance? Mm. Well, I, treat, I hear grace all the time. Yeah, well, but but that grace doesn't come without repentance. Mm-hmm. I love this one too. Hey, God loves you right where you are. No, He doesn't. <laughs> who, who told you that? Have you ever read Psalms five? He said He hates the people who don't repent. Isaiah, I cover my ears so I don't right. have to hear your prayers because right. you're so yeah. wicked. Yeah. It doesn't sound no, like you. No, what well, God? Are. He loves you enough to to remove you from where you are, mm-hmm. and He and, and He and He will love you where you are, but He's not going to leave you there. You got to repent. What did Jesus do? What did John the Baptist said? Hey, repent! The kingdom of God's at hand. Here it is. He's here. And then what did Jesus start saying? Repent or die. You know. So he calls you to repentance. So that's the first. What is repentance? Repentance means like you are facing in one direction, and Jesus is in the other direction. Your back is to Jesus, and your face is to your sin. And you say, "I will now turn a one eighty from my sin, and I will turn to Jesus, and I will submit to His authority." And I will confess that he is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. I want under your authority, Jesus, and I repent of my sin. I believe you alone can forgive me. I have a, I have a contrite and humble heart. I am truly sincere. I want to be forgiven. I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sin. I submit to your lordship. I confess publicly, either through a baptism or some way, that you now belong to Jesus. And then if, if you're sincere, it says that he, he will acknowledge that and he will save you. But then at that point, now you're just, all you are now is a drunk or a, an idiot that just re, that, that was just redeemed. You know, the process of now changing sanctification, discipleship now starts. Too many people take that one step, then they don't move. And a lot of times they're, 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 you see no impact or no change in that life. Jesus will change you in a moment as far as justify you. But as far as sanctifying you, that's still going on with Ken and Rick. We're still growing because that, that's a process of sanctification, and that comes through prayer and fasting and getting in the Word of God and getting involved in the local church and, and starting to pursue Jesus and growing in His Word. But those of you that are lost right now and you say, I can't fix this because I'm not a man of God, you're right. So, so repent. Repent of your sin. Confess Jesus is Lord. Come into His authority and say, look, I know that you love me. I understand the cross. It's obvious that you love me. But you got to teach me how to love you, because if I love you, I'll start obeying you. So last question, how important is being discipled? It is crucial. What, did, what, what does it say in the Great Commission? Go and make disciples. It doesn't say go and make converts. So you can't just leave them there. And I think what's happened 269 times in the New Testament, the word disciple is used. The word Christian is used three, and only once is it not derogatory. That's when Peter finally tells us in 1 Peter, I know they're making fun of all you disciples, calling you Christians. Don't wear it as a badge of honor now. See, we messed up because in the New Testament, everybody that was called a Christian, Ken, was a disciple. Mm -hmm. What we've done in the Western church is we go out and try to make Christians who were never disciples. We try to get converts, and then we just leave them. And and then they're devoured by the enemy. I'm not saying the enemy can take away their their salvation. That's not for me to say, but he certainly doesn't. they, They have no impact. They don't go make disciples because they never became one. Discipleship is crucial, and especially in men's ministry. You and I have talked about this. We've spent a tremendous amount of time taking care of the issues of men on the symptoms, and we don't address the disease. Mm. You know, yes, the man has porn problems. Yes, the man has his job out of whack. Yes, the man has his hobbies out of whack. Yes, the man, his eyes wander everywhere. Yes, the man's doing all these things, but that is not his problem. 
His problem is he's never been discipled. Either he's never been truly repentant and never been redeemed, or he's been left as a spiritual infant. So Jesus says in the Great Commission, and I've heard many people, uh, Dallas Willard calls it the Great Omission, he says, now teach them all that I have commanded you. Oh, great omission, I like that. Yeah. Well, I, well, I like everything Dallas Willard wrote. So. Yeah, oh gosh, well you talk about a challenger. So we have to make disciples. The reason why we don't have men being spiritual leaders in their home is they've never been discipled. Let's be clear for a minute, because mm-hmm. um, we were talking about this earlier too. Yeah. Discipleship to some people means men getting together and running around and having fun. No, that's fellowship. And so fellowship and discipleship can go together, Sure, but that's only one or the other. And as I had said to you, if I said, Rick, I want to learn how to, t- to speak Spanish, I want you to teach me Spanish, yeah, I think you're probably the wrong guy to go to for probably that. Probably so. But, you know, for the sake of argument, yeah. um, I'm not going to learn Spanish by us going duck hunting together. No. I mean, you may teach me how to t- t- count to 10 or you something. You may say que pasa, hola, but you don't know Spanish. Yeah. How am I going to learn Spanish? Maybe we go duck hunting, and then we sit down and we study, and you hold me accountable, and you say, did you do your lessons this week? And here's what we're going to study. Here's a yeah. greater meaning of what these words mean. And then after spending years with you, now I'm finally capable of ordering in a Mexican restaurant and sounding intelligent. Mm. But church so often does this. It, it, it's run around and have fun day. Well, that's not making people Nothing more wrong spiritual. with that. It's no. just not discipleship. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's fellowship. And we've been calling the men's ministry fellowship, discipleship forever. And the difference is intention, being yeah, I, intentional. Yeah. What, what if all of a sudden I declared to you I was a mechanic? And you're like, you're a mechanic? Absolutely. You said, okay, good. I'm about to go drive to the airport, and this car sounds funny. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what's wrong with it. <laughs> and you're like, well, how do you not know? Well, I'm a mechanic. Do you not know how a car works? I have no idea. Well, then you can't be a mechanic. You know, what are you? I'm a Christian. Really? So what do you know about it? Are you a disciple of Jesus? So tell me about him. What does it even mean? What, what, what is it? Yeah. And so we, we have to sit down and we spend time in the Word of God. Like you said, you and I may go duck hunting and have a blast, okay, especially if Phil has come down to his place. Yeah, right. But then when it's over, you know what I would say if we want to do discipleship? Because we did fellowship. Now, discipleship, we get back to the camp house, and we get out the, the Word of God, and our Bibles look tattered because they've actually been used. Like Phil's. Yeah, like Phil's. And we get it out, and we say, hey, man, let's talk about this. I've got a guy right now that is is probably my, my my biggest mentor and and the guy I spend the most time with getting discipled. It's gotten to the point now where we can't even go hunting anymore because we talk about Jesus so much the sun goes down and we never went out. But our intention was to go and hunt, but we end up talking about Jesus and getting in the Word. And what do you think about this scripture? Before we know it, our Bibles are out. We're discipling each other. It happened just uh, two weeks ago. He, he said, do you want to go hunt? I said, I think we've missed it. He said, what time is it? <laughs> I said, it's 4.15. He's like, you got to be kidding me. I thought it was like 3 o'clock. You know, we're going to do like an afternoon hunt, and we realized we've missed it. Mm -hmm. But that hunting became secondary to why we were there. It's important, and we still hunt. We have a great time. But discipleship is we're in the Word of God, and we're growing, and we're challenging each other, and we're, we're, how can a man not be embarrassed that he's a spiritual infant? Wouldn't you be embarrassed to be be, uh, not excellent at anything in your life? But yet, we're, how are we so okay with not being excellent in our spiritual life? Well, I don't I, even understand that. I am embarrassed with my golf game. That's why I don't well, golf. Well, I didn't want to bring I that up. not excellent. I didn't want to bring that up. Um, so wrapping up, you've been through, I think, the worst trauma that I can imagine, losing a child. You responded, and these are my words, not yours. You responded in a godly, mature manner because you were prepared. You had been discipled. You had been in Scripture. You had been in prayer. And at your wife and your children's greatest time of need, you were their dad because you were a man ready to go because you had Christian friends and you'd been in Scripture and whatnot. Last word as we sign off, because I think this is going to make an impact on a lot of people. Um, Go ahead. If there's anybody that is a spiritual leader for your wife and for your children, if you're a married man, listen to this, or if you're a single man, and you, you intend on that happening sometime in your life, if anybody else takes on that role, then they have become a better husband and father than you are. The, 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 this, this cannot be sidestepped. You, you cannot be who, who that wife and that child and the church and society, you can't be who they want you to be if you are not a disciple of Jesus. You've got to correct this. Amen. Because if, if it, it's, it's like we said before, the influence you have cannot be turned off. Some of you are trying to get in a neutral position. There is no neutral position. 
your influence is either an obstacle or a detriment to your family, to your church, to your society, or it's a blessing and an attribute. And the difference is that is whether you're, you're under the authority of Christ or not. And this is a really big deal. And I will tell you this, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're not a man, period. Rick Burgess, I couldn't have said it better than that. Where do they go to get the streaming of the Rick and Bubba show? Rick and Bubba show, you can go to rickandbubba.com, spell out the word and. All the information about the show is there. Uh, we also, um, if you have um, a, a need for a men's discipleship strategy at your church or your community or your group, uh, the Man Church. Use the word the. TheManChurch.com. We have all sorts of resources there. We have a, a plan, and we have curriculum, and we also have individual resources for individual men. Men, and we can help you, your church, your community, your group, plug something in. And we're we would love to come alongside you and help you any way we can. I hope the pastors are hearing that intentional discipleship from the Man Church uh, stuff. It's good stuff. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, and thank you for this. I'm excited for Promise Keepers to be back and let's lock arms and, and let's let's move this thing forward. Yeah, man. All right. Thanks, man.